Today's conversation involves time travel between me and the brain docs, uh, Aisha and Dean Sherzai, MDs. We started our conversation in June and something glitched and we got disconnected and could not reconnect that day or the next. And eventually life intervened and we didn't manage to get back together to do another recording for four months. So you're going to see me in the middle, just kind of uh, stitching together those those two conversations. Um, but as always, we're you know we're talking about brain health, about the tragedy of dementia, and how freaking preventable it is in so many cases, which makes the tragedy just compounded because it doesn't have to happen. When we know people who were bright, shining fixtures in our lives whose light has dimmed, whose cognition is gone, who are no longer the people they were, no longer having the memories or the connections of the relationships so hard. And the Sherzais have devoted their lives and their considerable energy and wit and charm and powers of persuasion and teaching ability to spreading the message that it doesn't have to be this way. So two conversations for the price of one. Strap in. Enjoy. Without further ado. Aisha and Dean Sherzai, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having us, Howie. I'm so glad that we could work our schedules together to get together and speak again. Missed you. It's always yeah. Good speaking with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just having a flashback. I think the first time you're on the podcast, I think it was Aisha by yourself. I think Dean was, was busy with something. And then I and I remember the both times I'd met each of you for the first time. I was really nervous because you guys were such superstars. It's like I, re, I really don't want to mess this up. And you're still superstars, but I'm no longer nervous. Oh, oh my God, your family. And Please. I do remember that conversation. Yeah. I was so thrilled. Yeah. Um, I knew of your work and continue to be such a big admirer of, of your incredible conversations and the kind of information that you put out there for everyone. So thank you. Well, right, right back at you. You guys have, have jumped into podcasting in a huge way in the in the past year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's going well. We we love the form, uh, the the um, the venue and, and, and the concept of bringing the perspective of everything um, from a neurological perspective, from a neuroscientific perspective. It just came naturally, I guess. It really we did. We had such a fun time speaking about the concepts and it has grown. It's been in the top 20 in sciences uh, continuously. Yeah, it's been so much fun to actually sit down across incredible people who oh. are doing amazing work and just talking to them, it, it's it's almost selfish. It is. I love yeah. the word work. It's just a selfish way of just enjoying life to to have conversations with these incredibly wonderful people. Yeah, I've I've been thinking that because I'm approaching like episode six hundred, wow. and I think I think about the people and I've talked to, and I'm all of a sudden I'm like, I must be really smart at this point. <laughs> like I've talked to some of the smartest people in the world for hours. Like, I must know something. It, it, that's literally, literally that you have your own personal course. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. True. Yeah. So uh, I have three things I wrote down that I wanted to talk to you about. Let's let's start with uh, with no, number one, which is uh, the Healthy Minds Initiative. The the work I'm um, on the board, so I can you know, follow what you're talking about. And I just I just want this work this work to get out more and more people to know about it. And and some deep pocketed billionaire is listening and is going to help it go forward. So uh, Absolutely. maybe just, you know, a brief um, summary of the work of what it is and then what what, uh, what you're up to now. Amazing. Absolutely. Um, we are so pleased to have you as part of the board um, and uh, your, your conversations <clears throat> during the board meeting just liven the whole um, uh, team up. And uh, we, we are so excited that you're bringing your, your leadership and management and especially coaching and guidance uh, perspective into this because it really centers around that, right? Uh, we, the, the point of HMI or Healthy Minds Initiative is to bring brain health to communities 
uh, and give them ownership and give them capacity and, and give them a way forward. And then not just be overseeing and, and you know, uh, dictating downward, but being partners and letting them become the best versions of themselves. Um, and and part of the most important part of that is uh, ability to, to give people the tools of self-improvement. Um, and it's available to everyone. I mean, within all, it's within all of us. It's the impediments that need to be addressed. And, and you do that so beautifully. I mean, absolutely. And, and Healthy Minds Initiative has done this in many communities. But right now we're focusing, uh, especially in a project that we think is, is the ultimate meaningful project when it comes to health in general, to be honest. And as it happens, the, the focus, the laser focus of this topic is brain health. But it applies to all health, which is listening to the communities and then creating programs around the community's proclivities, tendencies, needs, resources, um, their, uh, their, uh, their fears, their desires. All these things are basically driven by the community. Even the research model has to be driven by the community, meaning that there has to be conversation at the core. There has to be um, um, uh, a conversation with leaders, with community members, knowing how to interact, how to um, uh, uh, connect, what language to use, what resources to use. It's not going to be people being brought into a clinic and given Mediterranean diet, which is ridiculous. Or some of the studies that we've been part of big studies, big universities, and then halfway through, we find out that because we were part of the overseeing board, that the intervention was a protein bar. Hmm. That's not something sustainable. That's not something that's, that's possible uh, to bring about change. Yeah. In order to bring about change, you need to understand communities and to listen to, me, to communities. And that's where um, your incredible gift has been a profound gift for HMI. Well, so I want, I want to unpack that, um, the, the whole approach, because people who are listening might think, well, that's, that all sounds pretty obvious. Like there's nothing exciting about what you said. It was just like, duh, but it's very, <laughs> it's not what happens, right? It's not, it's, it's, you know, the protein bar is sort of the tip of the iceberg of, of how these things end up. But in terms of how health professionals approach communities, specifically marginalized and traditionally underserved communities, is very different. And by the way, before we get to that, I live you know, a mile from the Mediterranean. And I have to say that if I had the, Mediter the Mediterranean diet would consist solely of seaweed and jellyfish. So I don't, I don't know what people are talking about. There's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's exactly. almost nothing good in that, in that sea. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, and and uh, imagine we we feed the southeast LA seaweed and uh, jellyfish. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, yeah, to unpack it at, at the core is listening, and the reason it's not happening because it takes investment from the researchers. I mean, imagine an average researcher has a team and they have a budget, finite budget, and they have a protocol to follow. And that protocol has to have a timeline, a, a lifespan. And, and if, if it's broader than just give the survey, collect the data, come back, uh, put the intervention in, re record the outcome in six months. If it's anything more than that, it becomes daunting and it becomes problematic. It becomes a little uncomfortable for, for researchers who are not used to talking to people, right? But... <laughs> Reality is you have to speak, you have to listen. Um, listening is leadership. Listening is the core of leadership. And, and that takes time. There's a model called CBPR, Community-Based Participatory Research. The action part is CBPA. Um, so and it, at the core of that model is listening to the community first through focus groups and then taking that writing and distilling it into meaningful, actionable steps and then listening again with the community with the new data and then so multiple steps until you get to a core that is actually the community and not some survey created in boston in 1950s being applied you know from 50 year old white men being applied to 70 year old hispanic women 
in, in 2024. And it's, it, it really has to take that much time. And a lot of the studies you see, 50 people going through, you know, what, 12 weeks with some food given and then some cognitive testing done. Even if you see a delta or a change, which actually a lot of times is contrived, I can assure you, but with that period of time, it's, it's not going to be meaningful long term. What have you done as far as sustainability of that? What have you done as far as making sure that that becomes part of that community's culture? Um, and that's, that's the core of, um, of this. Well, and I mean, it sounds like that your basic mindset is that these communities are not broken. They're, they're not helpless, that they have the knowledge, skills, drive, networks, connections to better their own health. And, and they need a catalyst and they need someone from the outside to believe in them. And they need, they need some coordination to remove the impediments. Absolutely. I think that was beautifully stated. Um, in many situations, um, you realize that uh, one of the key ingredients that is not present in any model of change introduced by healthcare providers or an outside agency is understanding the status quo or the existing knowledge within that community, because nobody really has time for conversations because it's tough. Um, and somehow brochures are created and dispersed within the community that has nothing to do with their day-to-day -day living or their understanding or their function of what health is. And so that discrepancy causes failure. And unfortunately, that keeps getting repeated over and over again. And what we're doing in Healthy Minds Initiative is starting with a conversation. We've had multiple conversations, first of all, to find out the pain points, the strengths, the limitations, any impediments, and just working with those pain points and limitations and trying to see how we can provide assistance for them to continue living the kind of lives that is appropriate for them, that is health, helpful for them. And as far as health literacy is concerned or understanding and awareness is concerned, those are the things that we, we actually help provide. So for example, um, just, a, just a small example, the thought that dementia is synonymous with aging. And that has become a part and parcel of certain communities' culture. Oh, it's really normal for grandma to have memory problems. It's really normal for a dad to have blood pressure when he's in his 50s, right? So, so that those need to be broken. And those are the kind of conversations that we truly love engaging with, where we say, no, there is, there's another way to live. There's another way to exist. And here's what we can all do to kind of change that narrative, change that language. So it's a really comprehensive and a multifaceted approach to health and wellness and longevity. And to be honest with you, it's a lot of fun too. We, it, and, and the learning is both ways. You know, we actually learn so much about how information is consumed within each community too, which is fascinating. Hmm. <clears throat> so what's coming up for me is questions about resistance to, first of all, resistance to you guys coming in because until they know you, you could just be another bunch of, you know, Harvard researchers coming to do a survey. So I'm imagining that there's some, you know, ba barriers you need to break down to, to prove to people that you're interested in them and not interested in doing things to them. Um, let's, start, let's start with there because I, I don't want to mix the two questions. I have another one that I wrote down, so I'll probably remember it. So uh, breaking through those barriers are difficult. Let me give you an example. Uh, in in uh, 2010 or 11, uh, as part of my PhD, I actually went to communities. I, I was fortunate because I was getting my PhD as a, as a attending, so I had a little more resources. I went to the communities, and most of the communities, um, uh, well, the Native American community here in uh, San Bernardino or Inland Empire, um, they said, we don't want to work with anybody from the university side. I, I was shocked. I mean, because we were bringing some, some, you know, information, some tool. They, and what we heard from the leadership was that people come, they do all kinds of the usual gestures and smiles and, and handshakes and uh, documents pictures. and pictures, pictures yeah. and, and PowerPoints and all, all kinds of stuff. And then after they've collected data, they disappear. They completely disappear and, and nothing for the community except their time wasted, their hopes raised. And, and I call this the nuclear landscape of leadership. Uh, 
when you're a leader or you're given or you've been given the privilege of being a leader and leader is not somebody who's taking somebody to a war or something like that. It's anybody who actually takes the lead in an activity um, or is given the privilege of being given the lead in an activity. Uh, when people come to that person, they're actually suspending their natural inclination to disbelief, their natural inclination to uh, to be protective of themselves. They're suspending all these these fear fears. They're suspending the um, uh, the incredulity, and and they are opening up, and they're opening up because they have hope. The most important thing we have. And then when when somebody fails that, they're not just they've not just affected that interaction. They've affected that landscape of that person's mind for years going forward. This person will not be open to other people who might be good people who are trying to do things because the person or the community has been, has, has, has uh, been lied to. Their hopes have been thwarted. And, and, and that's a nuclear landscape that you've created because you took the lead and all you did was use that situation for your momentary gain. So there's an incredible, immense responsibility. Um, we are, you know, a little, um, uh, we don't have camps. And it appears we live in a world of camps. And right now there's a plant-based camp and then the meat-eating camp and this camp and that camp. We have none of those camps. It's the, it's the camp of the, of the person in front of us that needs help. And we, and, and we have to listen to that person and and we have to listen to the point that the person that believes you and then once they believe you then their responsibility is immense to do everything to make sure to at least give the effort to make the outcome come about nobody's expecting perfection often they expect failure if they see effort so that trust building is immense that trust building takes time that trust building takes investment that trust building requires not contrived social media sacrifice, but real life time and effort and, and blood and sweat uh, sacrifice. That doesn't sound like research, does it? But that's real leadership and research is that. And, and hopefully um, we've done that in HMI enough where, we're, where whatever communities we've gone to, we've given that part at least. Um, and that's important because then that becomes the nidus of building everything else. You want to change people's behaviors towards healthier life. Why would people change their comfort that they've grown up with for 50, 60, 70 years? Because you just said so, because you're from Harvard or from your Stanford. Um, they might for a short period, but they're going to go back unless they trust not your accolades and then the number of degrees behind your name but the words that you say that affect them personally. Mm. Wow. I'm just going to let that sit, sit for a second because it's, I mean, it's so different. I mean, when I think about, I, you know, I had a master's in public health and my job, and I wasn't doing anything big. I wasn't have, I didn't have any funders. I was just trying to get a damn master's degree. And so, you know, I had to go like find a group of people and basically extract data from them. Yeah. Like that was my mission. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I didn't help anybody. And I probably hurt a bunch of people. You know, it was a small scale. So it wasn't probably not terrible. But I was never taught to go in and, and have those conversations to really ask what people need. You know, that we had models. The models had that kind of questioning embedded in them. One of them I remember was called Precede Proceed, that was like very complex and had all these different inputs. But the reality was you didn't have the time to do that. So you just read reports and you read other people's studies and you talked to a couple of leaders and, and you know, it really was, was treating these. And, and these were all marginalized communities that were, you know, I worked with kids in a juvenile detention center. Like they, they didn't exactly have the power to say no. Yeah. You know, and I was, I was more interesting than basketball, I guess, you know, yeah. uh, so they, would hang out with me for a little while, but it feels it feels like just the, the way the the research industry is set up, it, it it can't be anything but extractive. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, you guys are doing amazing work, but it's a drop in the bucket of of this behemoth. And and the more the behemoth rolls along, the harder it is for you to do your job. 
Yeah. You know, are there are there systemic solutions, or do we have to rely on tireless heroes? Oh, oh no, 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 never tireless heroes. Yeah. Uh, I, that never works. That never. That's not sustainable. And and there are no tireless heroes. Uh, uh, you know, we all have our flaws and all of that. But reality is, there has to be some systemic um, change introduced into the research model. And I think there is the at least in the academic realm and within the academic circles and within the academic PowerPoint presentations, there is a change. I've seen it in universities coming and uh, we, we've, we've had many conversations and w uh, spontaneously we hear this approach of community-based and, and listening to the community. At least that first awareness, that first point of awareness is, is becoming more ubiquitous and universal and, and, and people are becoming aware. Whether it's being applied is the next, now the next thing, which is the funding and the infrastructure has to adapt to that awareness, that consciousness. And that's usually how it happens. When the signal from the truth becomes massive enough, then the system and the funding changes towards that. So the first step is we're hearing it everywhere now. Yes, definitely. Um, you see it in specific research RFAs, supports, um, call to actions from bigger uh, organizations. But this is something very new. And I think it's happening because of just the massive failure that a lot of these organizations have seen over the last you know, few years and decades where spending millions and billions of dollars on a quote unquote intervention led to nowhere, right? So, so even though we have you know, shiny uh, diagnostics and, and research equipment, when it comes to true health and change in uh, the quality of life, we didn't really see any changes. So like Dean said, the narrative is changing and, and that's a good thing. Hmm. I'm curious about whether effective altruism, that movement is having a positive or negative or neutral or bipolar effect on, on, on research. Cause I've heard so many, you know, so much of it makes sense. And there's a lot of assumptions baked into the algorithms by which they choose to to you know, direct their donations? Um, I, I mean, I think the concept is, 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 is sound and it makes sense. Um, um, uh, um, it, it's almost like functional altruism. It's, it's, it's the idea that um, you find the mechanisms behind it, the algorithms behind it, and, and, and then you, you make it come about. Um, and and at, at one level, it does make sense, and and and, uh, but uh, it has to be, it has to be inculcated in the consciousness at a higher level as well. Um, um, it, uh, the the greater understanding, social understanding, has to be that there's mechanisms behind it, and we all have to follow those, or we have to be aware of those mechanisms for the outcome to take place. So um, yeah, in short, I think there is something to it. Okay, gotcha. So the, the other thing that I, that I wrote down that I wanted to follow up on is when you tell people, you know, the, the thing you offer is hope and you say it doesn't have to be this way. And I'm thinking that there are people for whom that message was, would actually be really hard to hear because it would mean they would have to face a lot of grief, right? That it didn't have to be this way, that you know, that we thought this was just the way things were and there were things that could have been done. It, right? Do you, do you get that kind of reaction? Do people have yeah. to go through that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I, I experience it in clinical setting um, almost all the time. And I think that's just by design because unfortunately the clinic system is such that the need arises when things are out of hand and people truly experience the um, the negative effects of any condition, right? So at that point, when they come into the clinic, although that has changed in our clinic, we're actually promoting prevention. But, you know, most of the time when people come in with neurological conditions, in our case as neurologists, that have advanced significantly, there's only so much that you can do. So prevention matters, early detection matters. And when the conversation comes in, I guess um, 
I don't have a particular specific, you know, a cookie cutter approach to it. It just depends on the person, but mm -hmm. we try to mitigate their fears and make them not feel any blame or shame Yeah, um, that it is not because they didn't do anything about it. It's mostly because we're learning, we're growing. This is, this is something that we've just come to understand more and more, more recently. And, um, specifically when it comes to diseases of the mind and especially cognitive impairment, there's always a, there's always a notion that it's a personal condition, but it's not, it's more of a family condition. It's more of a community's condition, you know, the caregivers, the loved ones around that particular person, um, their colleagues and everybody else is affected in many ways as well. So it's not just intervention at the patient level, but at the family level as well. And so, um, you know, dispersing this information seems empowering. And so it, it just depends on the kind of words that we use, the, the person's situation, the, the, the family around them. Um, and um, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to my lovely husband. I used to joke around. So, you know, he wasn't attending at Loma Linda and I was, I was a resident. So I was a resident fellow, but just a few years behind him. And whenever Dean would actually have patients in his clinic room, we would all know that all the chairs from every clinic room would disappear because he would grab all the chairs and take it to his room and his room would be packed with six, seven, even 10 people. And then some people waiting outside, he would invite the whole family to come for conversations about it. And the same thing happens within the community as well. So, and I've never heard laughter from a room when you know, a devastating condition like dementia is being used, but there were, there would be laughter. There would be like, we're going to do this together. There's a lot of hope. Let's go ahead and start this project. And so that's the approach that I have actually personalized as well, where there's no blame, there's no shame, there's no feeling bad about it, but what do we have? What can we do about it moving forward? And also separating the medical condition from the person. Sometimes people start defining themselves by the chronic conditions that they carry. Human beings are human beings. They're the lovely people that they are. That was the same when they were four years old or nine years old. And now they're 99 years old. They are that person. The mm. condition that they're experiencing is completely a separate situation. And the conversation is about that, not about the person. So with those kind of techniques, I think we get to a place where there is that feeling of comfort and giving them enough tools to move forward. Yeah. Um, uh, just to, uh, a little side on that uh, is that um, uh, what you bring is actually extremely important because as we become more aware of the underlying mechanisms of disease and when you bring light upon those underlying mechanisms, no matter what people feel guilty <clears throat> there and, and, the language out there is one of blame and shame, um, uh, whether it's obesity, whether it's diabetes, whether it's hypertension, whether it's, um, uh, you know, stroke and dementia, uh, it's, oh, it was, it had to do with cholesterol and uh, you didn't go, uh, you, you know, full whole food plant-based and you, you heard about it and, and all these, and, and the sooner we realize that it's a cognitive journey that we're all going through and there's no blame. It's just a self, it's an ever manifesting truth to all of us. Then, then it becomes a, a sense of, oh, we all are going through this together. Uh, I, I have beginnings of this disease. You have beginnings of that disease or you have this condition and that condition. We all had things happen to us that we could have done all otherwise, but uh, it, it's just a, a ever manifesting truth and, and then that takes away the blame it, it is such an important concept it is such an important concept that that the idea of tacit shaming is so prevalent in medical fields i mean you and i we are all involved in social media and these these diet wars part of it is shaming Mm. Um, and, and, and it's critical that we take all of that out and make it data driven. There's the human side, which we must love and all their totality, all their frailty and all our, uh, incompleteness and all our, and then there's the data side, which we should separate and say, okay, 
If we want to lower this outcome, stroke, which comes from AFib, hypertension, diabetes, these are the inroads, including um, um, you know, um, um, uh, access to information, access to resources, um, and, and knowledge and ads in the region as far as the four, uh, four hours timeline, all that. It's the in input and output kind of a, a situation when it comes to data. And put the human component separately and just love the people. I mean, that dichotomy is critical. Again, yeah. it takes effort, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's so, you know, I feel the urge to shame other people about their health choices when I'm scared for myself. Because right? that, that gives me a feeling, well, I have control, so it's not going to happen to me. Right. So I can I can I can feel where it comes from. Yeah, I, it, completely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, just, I was just reading a, uh, a book today by Charles Duhigg, who's a um, sort of a science journalist. And he wrote it was, it was a book called, I think, Super Connectors or Super Communicators, mm -hmm. the people who are incredible at communicating. And I was just reading a section about um, kind of not going to remember his name. It was a doctor, um, surgeon that I think. Um, some, some of the pre prestigious hospitals in New York City, um, who was advising people, of who, men who are going to have prostate, um, possibly having prostate surgery because they, they had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And his read on the literature was that in almost all cases, active surveillance is preferable to surgery. And he was telling people this and going over all the details in the studies and giving them papers with highlight, yellow highlighted and he says, the more he talked, the more people were actually going for the surgery. They were just, you know, getting more and more terrified. And he reached out to a communication specialist who followed him around, watched what he was doing, and realized that he was talking about data and analytics and information. And people were interested in how long, you know, what will my sex life be? What will I be there for my kids? What, you know? What is, is five years of life worth the pain? And he was completely missing yeah. what the human experience. So I think it's, it's, it's so beautiful that you bring up, like we're gonna talk about the humans. Yeah. And then on top of that, separately and additionally, we're gonna bring the science, but only when people are receptive for it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Beautifully absolutely. stated. It, it, it has to be that way. As you said it beautifully, uh, I'm definitely going to look, look into this book. Yeah. But um, if you're not going to connect to the people, n no amount of data is going to change people's minds. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, before we before we move on, can you just have a couple of stories of like HMI, you know, <clears throat> outcomes, successes, fun, like a, 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 a picture, a vivid picture yeah. of what's what's going on. We've had three community events, which were incredible, oh. incredible. I mean, so beautiful. Um, uh, the whole community came out. It's um, uh, Crenshaw. It's in uh, one of them uh, in Southeast LA. And, um, and the, the, num the number of people that came to these events mm -hmm. to, to learn, to participate, to to, um, uh, to 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 change their lives. Let me give you an example of how important it is not to uh, push an agenda, but to connect to people. <clears throat> We're whole food plant based, and when we go to the communities, we never push that concept. We say eat less saturated fat, eat less processed carbs, um, eat more plants, greens. Uh, that's it. That's, that's nutrition wise. That's basically it. Basically, they know what yeah. we are. Just, yeah. We actually say ahead of time, this is what we are and why and all of that. But but where you are is uh, uh, around your life and your situation and uh, your diet. And we said no, no plant based food. Uh, don't, don't we don't push it. So the, in the second event, we had community members bring bring food, um, uh, have stalls where people actually could could create food and uh, sell it to others. And we never push the plant-based version or any of that. And every single stall was plant-based <laughs> without us ever bringing it up. Because when you push the idea aggressively without making the connection, without the connection, it's imposition. 
without the connection, it's it's absolute uh, imposition and 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 it's an edict. Um, even though it's coming out of papers and 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 data and so on and so, it, it's an edict. But when you're connecting and they're connecting to you, then it becomes much more receptive. And and we we take pride in that sure moment do. more than any other. And. Yeah. And, and 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 similarly, this has happened over and over and over and over again. And one of the effort in the community was uh, people think that when we come to the communities, as far as brain health, we're going to do some kind of special exercise on cognition. Or The first uh, um, event was about giving away blood pressure machines because 20 to 30 percent of cognitive decline and dementia is attributable to un, untreated blood pressure, easily treatable thing. And the number of community members that got blood pressure machines and got involved, and then they would come back and tell us about their numbers and the fact that they took these numbers to their doctor, and then their blood pressure was changed, was just un- unbelievable. And it was incredibly powerful because you could see the tangible change in front of you over weeks after that simple, simple act. So it's going to take those kind of simple acts that have sustainability, that has meaning to them. And um, that, 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 so many of those stories uh, like that. And we discovered that there were already so many amazing people that were doing great work. It, they were just not highlighted. For example, we met, uh, we met Ruth. She's, uh, I think she's in her 90s. Yes. She's one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. She's in her 90s and she used to be a teacher. And throughout her career, she actually taught kids how to create a garden. So she actually had created multiple gardens in, uh, you know, like the small little school patios that they had in, you know, south, uh, southeast L.A. And she came to one of these events and she was telling us her stories. And we realized that, you know, she was already she was doing she was doing the good work already. And so what we did was she, we connected her to the group of individuals who were community workers, social workers, trying to, you know, raise awareness and concern about what their children were eating. And by just bringing them together in that platform, they actually started a whole project and they pushed it forward. Or for example, we realized that there were so many amazing nurses and nurse practitioners within that community that were already uh, dispersing information about blood pressure management, cholesterol, diabetes, weight issues, and they volunteered. They came and they actually taught hundreds of people of how to measure their blood pressure. They created blood pressure diaries. We actually helped them create sleep diaries. We actually had booths for uh, women who and men who would come in and want to talk about their mental health issues with someone. So these nurse practitioners and nurses just like automatically became community leaders. And what we were doing in the back end was just kind of giving them all the resources that they need so they could continue doing the great work that they were already doing it. Just kind of gave gave them the framework. And this happened within like three events. Imagine if this is a continuous process and that's what we're actually doing kind of highlighting these incredible human beings that are already doing wonderful things for the community and make sure that most of the community members have access to that kind of an information. How, how do you, if it's an event-based um, collaboration, how do you know what happens between events? Because you'd mentioned that, you know, there's so many interventions that come in that don't get sustained, that leave the community, you know, you come in with a, you know, firecrackers and you leave the community high and dry. What, what is um, ongoing and sustainable about yeah. the HMI approach? Yeah. So uh, even the mechanism of data collection and uh, um, um, surveillance is within the community. So we have people, we have uh, Ron, who is, how old is he? Um, uh, he has in his 70s. In his 70s. Yeah. He has been the director of Alzheimer's awareness for the community for a long time. One of the, again, one of the loveliest uh, human beings. Him, along with the nurses and others, are continually engaging with the community members, getting feedback, getting information, collecting information. And and that's, that's going to continue and actually expand as we go forward so that that system of surveillance 
and course correction is actually incorporated within the community as opposed to it's a contrived mechanism that's put on uh, 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 superimposed on a, on a community. So that is another pride point that uh, the community members will be able to sustain this mechanism going forward. And it's a continuous iterative process. So we see uh, the magnitude of change um, after a particular um, intervention or introduction of an intervention. And so there's a lot of course correction. There's a lot of change um, and focus on things that need the most attention. And I think that's the example of that systematic approach that we were discussing earlier. Um, you know, the feel good sessions of getting everybody together is very, very important. But the follow up with data and with feedback and surveys, that's the research component of it that actually helps us course correct and highlight the necessary interventions that are needed within the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I know that HMI would like more funding. And at the same time, it, it sounds like this is a very lean model. Like it's a, it's a model that could be replicated in lots of places that would cost a lot less than things that are happening now that might be, you know, either dri driven by, you know, the, the standard research and intervention industry or private companies, you know, look, looking to expand market share. Um, I mean, I'm, what, what are, what are, like, what's your vision? If you, if, you know, if I said the year 2050 and everything goes the way you want it to go, obviously, it's going to be way bigger than you guys. Um, what's 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 the vision? What's possible? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Uh, scalability, because if it's not scalable and adaptive to every community, then we've just done what we just said was not useful, uh, which is this uh, this model of collecting data from the community. That's uh, that's uh, community specific, community unique and identifying the resources and all the tools and then implementing changes using all the resources that already exist in the community and following outcome in an iterative process is definitely scalable and changeable. So I think that this is, um, this is the way to go. And, and this is the only program that I think that takes scalability into perspective at a cost that's almost nominal. For some reason, the connection got cut and being as busy as we all are, that was in June, we rescheduled for early November. So coming back in to the conversation, honestly, we had forgotten what we talked about. So if there's repetition or disjointedness, please forgive us. But again, happy to present Aisha and Dean Sherzai. All right, we're back. I, I forgot to check continuity. I don't know if we're wearing the same clothes. Oh, as, no. As, no, probably not. Probably not. As our conversation that we had at the end of, of June, it's four, it's over four months later. Um, I don't know what we were talking about then, um, but tell, tell me about um, what you guys are up to, what's happened over the summer and and where, where you guys are now with this, with the idea of a community based approach to to brain health and overall health. Yeah, um, we are very excited. Uh, we have two realms that, that we work on. One is our clinical and, and um, um, our own life work where we have to kind of create a uh, persistence and, and, and resources for ourselves and our family and things of that nature. And we'll delve into that. But then the other part is, which is our passion, which is the community side of things, um, how to bring brain health into the communities. And it matters <clears throat> because at the end of the day, our brain is us. It's what makes us, and we do change. If, if things left to their um, own, uh, we change negatively. We change, we deteriorate, because the things around us are deteriorating, whether it's the noise around us or the environmental stimuli or the food that's, that are you know, being advertised or the stress that's being imposed or the traumas that are being imposed on us. And, and all of these things are going to deteriorate our, our uh, cognitive function, brain function. It's going to steal from us, not build us, but reduce us. Reduce us in so many different ways. Uh, reduce us as far as our breadth and depth 
of the understanding of this complex thing that is our our living experience and and or and at the same time it's going to reduce us as far as the functionality of our brain um, um the damage that accumulates can be quite quite significant and we see this in people you've seen this on tv and everywhere around you where the same people that you've known 30 years ago they don't sound the same but the alternative is available and, and this is not one of those gimmicks because we're not selling anything it's 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 critical that we speak about those alternatives to fight in the face of the negative environmental variables that are there to decay, not in a nefarious way, it's just the nature of, um, of um, uh, how the world has developed. And being aware of it gives you some tools. <clears throat> and, and I think that's our passion. Yeah. And, and the reason is <clears throat> certain communities are more susceptible to that damage <clears throat> because of the differential lack of access or prevalence of harm in certain communities. And it's a cumulative harm, meaning that what's going on in their childhood, what's going on in their environment as they grow up, what's going on in their neighborhoods, because it's much more easy to uh, build a, um, a fast food joint. <clears throat> I was about to uh, name a company and you were gonna get banned again for another six months. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but uh, from some fast food joints, it's much easier to build that and push that on people than healthy resources uh, like um, uh, you know f fresh fruits and vegetables and things of that nature. Um, it's much e much easier to occupy people to sit in front of a, the, the boob tube television for hours at a time and and market to them than to go out there and experience environment and and beauty and everything else, which actually has been created into a cement uh, blocks. Um, and the point of this is not to put down the, the world we live in or the economic system we live in. That's fantastic. It's by our awareness we can change the direction of, of what's happening around us and also the destiny of the thing that makes us who we are, which is our brain. So, I mean, it seems like it's um, possibly iterative in that so we, ha we have this amazing world. We have incredible technologies. We have wealth beyond anything that previous generations could have ever imagined. And yet, you know, it's, it's increasingly concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And a lot of that, the wealth concentration seems to be at the expense of people who live in communities like this. Is, is, there, some, is there some way that like the little stuff that we can do around a community, getting them to fend off some of these deteriorations, can they can they then access their their brains to make bigger changes? Um, I suppose so. So so it's a it's a complex formula. Um, uh, you essentially provide enough information and enough knowledge to a community uh, that is palatable. That is. Um, within their scope of understanding. It's almost like you're giving them a pair of glasses with specific lenses to be able to look around them and identify factors that are going to help them be the best versions of who they are. Um, and that lens is different for each and every community. So step, a step previous to that is understanding and defining what that lens is and what the resources are within the community. And once that happens, then, you know, reiterating the, the specific components around them that could help them build a better brain, um, a better <clears throat> awareness, better understanding and better cognition at the end of the day. As neurologists, that's our that's our ultimate goal for people to have, you know, a healthy brain and the best cognitive prowess that they can use to you know, experience life and to enjoy life and to um, live a life where they don't rely on anyone, you know, to the best of their capacity. And so giving them enough knowledge, identifying the resources and having them make decisions that are not difficult, uh, that are not backbreaking, because as you know, as a coach and as someone who is very, very knowledgeable about habit creation, it has to be easy. It has to be small. It has to be incremental. And so how do you, how do you provide them with that 
uh, with that package is what requires a lot of work on our end and it's a, it's a lot of fun but the reason why it has failed in the past from the different data that we're seeing is at multiple levels either there was lack of identification of resources or the scientists and the implementers of the plan didn't really consider uh, identifying those lenses that I was talking about and then abandoning that plan and not having enough motivational steps um, to, to, to propagate the message and give them a message of hope um, and get mm. rid of the fear mongering of this concept of change. Yeah, well, I remember, you know, in graduate school, the health belief model, mm -hmm. right? This was this idea that if you just told people the consequences of their behavior, that they would change, that we're, we're rational actors. Then when I when I went to work in change management in uh, you know, on an organizational level, the mantra was people don't change because they see the light, they change because they feel the heat. Mm -hmm. And there's tr there's a lot of truth to the initial impetus often being negative, right? For an individual, it's a, a heart attack <clears throat> or someone someone close to you, you're, you know, who you identify with dies or gets sick. But what we're what we've learned and I think what you know, what I see you guys doing so well is you immediately like once there's that motion, you immediately work to convert it into a, a, a positive vision that that people can get excited about moving towards rather than something that they're just fearing and have to move away from. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. I think um, irrespective, uh, it, it's it's signals, right? The brain works on signals, how much signal is uh, the underlying current that's being pushing that's pushing in one direction or the other so that's one element and then there's the small systems of push and signals that are maintaining that directional change that's basically it and how do those two systems work is at the limbic level and their interaction with the frontal lobe frontal lobe creates the arguments the concepts the patterns and the limbic system is the emotional tone uh, that that keeps you going in one direction or the other, and if you if you do the mathematical model of that for each individual, let's take it in. It's it's figuring out what is the underlying drive, and, and, and simply stated, I've seen this in so many talks. Find your why. Okay, great. I found my why. That's the little agitation. That's the language around that agitation. That's that fear uh, element. That's that emotional element that's there. You've created memories around it. And if you're, if you're good at it, you're going to create multiple memories. And you're going to, if you're really good at it, you're going to create multiple memories around that in different regions and different places that you usually fail so that that triggers and all that. Okay, fantastic. So that you have control of one element of that emotional signal, which is the fear element. Then the other thing is the attractor that had you going in the other direction, being aware of that or those it's critical the, what is the thing that keeps failing you what's mm. the thing that you you just fasted and you just ate well and everything and then but you just turned the corner and you you went in a party and all of a sudden you had you saw wine and or you saw some piece of um, uh, cake or something like that and, and and that signal was more powerful than all the signals that you, you had created all the triggers that you had all the um, trip wires that you had set in place so knowing that is critical as well. So that, that's it. So that creates the, you're, you're, you're creating your landscape triggers and, and, and trip wires and, and um, the signs, the X signs, um, all of that. We were watching the, the movie uh, uh, Planet of the Apes. Uh, there's a part where they're not supposed to cross this area because there's these X's on top of the mountain. Well, in this story, it's a good, good thing. This is, I'm not going to go there. It's going to trigger. So that kind of setting of, triggers of positive triggers of negative gives you some measure and then then comes the third element which is the dopamine surge of moving forward and once you figure out the triggers the positive and negative triggers then now you work on the dopamine steps of moving you forward and you, that is different for each person the length of those triggers dopamine triggers are different for each person you can see it's complex but it's actually not that complex. Where we have failed people is, the biggest model is forget about this trigger or that trigger, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Look, I did it so you can do it. 
it's the the dumbest of all. I'm gonna, I, you know, as a scientist, you're not supposed to use emotional terms like dumb, but there is a little bit of a. Um, I'm, I'm trying to trigger an emotional pushback against that kind of simplification from here on going forward. It's not going to work like that. The people that have failed are not bad. The people that have failed, I don't even call them fail, but the, um, are not dumb. It's that it's more complex than, than just saying that. Uh, and, and, and if we just listen to our communities at the community level, you broadly can figure out the triggers that makes them afraid of their own environmental consequences. The communities that you and I and all of us work in the African-American communities, stroke is threefold. Dementia is threefold. Diabetes, exponential. I mean, everything. Being, the first step is being aware of those things. And what are those things linked with? Now, okay, that's great. Those are triggers that we created. And, and where you see that and this and that, so you, you create that knowledge, awareness. And then the next step is the positive side, the little steps that you can take around the home. So that takes some work. That's not a survey that you created in Harvard and then you apply it to San Bernardino. You know, you, the survey was created in the 50-year-old white men and then applied to 70-year-old Hispanic women, which is, doesn't even make sense because the triggers are different. The environmental triggers are different. The social triggers are different. The cultural triggers are different, positive and negative. The, the, the movements, the steps of movements are different. And if we just listen to people, truly listen to people, and not listen to then give surveys, not listen to then trigger the next thing of yours, which is the next uh, research project, then you'll get to understand some of the mechanisms. Um, and I think that is so important. That's the work that you do. We really uh, love your, your approach to coaching, your approach to teaching, your approach to understanding, your approach to change. Um, and we, we, we want everybody to kind of listen to you and, and hopefully we do kind of the same thing as well. But, but uh, that's, that's the approach. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bask in that, uh, that uh, lovely praise for a moment and just uh, let, let it wash over me and grow. So thank you. Um, I mean, you know, the, the problem with that, I know it's not really a problem for you guys, is that it's not really scalable in the way, you know, like if you were to, to, to say, like, here's my business plan, if you were to go to a bunch of VCs and say, can you give me $50 million of a series A round? Because I want to do this. I want to build this community based approach to uh, cognitive function and brain health. And you said, here's my plan. We go in and we listen to each community and it's a, sp a bespoke thing and we have no idea what the intervention is going to look like before we go in. And we're going to empower the community members themselves rather than, you know, salaried people, uh, you know, kind of or running the program from above. You wouldn't get a penny. I, I think the problem is not so much um, uh, scalability. The problem is time scale. Uh, the problem is that um, companies and governments work on different time scales, and these are false delineations, which um, which um, take away from the true power of these slightly longer um, um, uh, projects. Let's take one of those variables: mm -hmm. blood pressure. <clears throat> we'll take two of them. Um, th actually, three. We'll take sleep, blood pressure, and hearing. So now we know that hearing loss has been uh, attributed to about 10% or more of cognitive decline, actually probably higher in cognitive decline, but 10% of dementias. The cost of Alzheimer's dementia by itself is 345 billion direct cost, another 350 billion indirect cost per year. That's massive. And that's gonna go above a trillion fairly soon, which by itself will, dis the, if you can affect that by 5%, that's $350 billion a year, or sorry, yeah, the 5%, uh, about, yeah, no, sorry, $35 billion a year. And over, three, over 10 years, 350, just hearing, meaning that um, this project is going to save the government, it's gonna save the insurance company, it's gonna save the caregiving company, companies, profound amount of money. But the time scales are a little longer. The data is actually stronger than anything they have. What is the data on, treating Alzheimer's now, zero, zero. Um, um, so 10% is phenomenal. Let's take the next thing, blood pressure. 
by the most conservative measure, that's going to affect Alzheimer's by 20%, vascular dementia by, by 50% or more, strokes by profound amounts. I mean, we're talking... 90%. Yeah. Uh, the disease after disease after disease. We're talking about potentially just addressing blood pressure. It's going to easily affect $500 billion in the United States. I mean, because of multiple diseases, including cancers affected by blood pressure. You name it. But yet when we go to communities, blood pressure is the number one variable that's, that's killing people in the communities. The number one underknown, understated, under-resourced thing in the communities. So just increasing knowledge about blood pressure, creating tools that measure blood pressure more acutely, creating triggers that then uh, push the treatments towards blood pressure, both lifestyle or otherwise, you save profoundly. So it's not a matter of scalability. Blood pressure is easily measured large scale and, and uh, the cost is actually pretty nominal, yet the outcome is massive. One stroke patient costs the hospital system more than $50,000. That's just stroke. And we have 800,000 of them every year. Every year. So it is scalable. It's not, it's not around the time scales of companies or governments. Well, I want to push back a little bit because I, I think I agree with you that the interventions... I'm the going base... to leave this podcast in that case. Okay, Howie. Yeah, we're this done. Is, this is done. done. I can't take this. This is abuse. <laughs> this is complete and utter abuse. It, it was a total ad hominem. <laughs> A total ad hominem. <laughs> Just an attack from the left field. What is this? <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. Go for it. <clears throat> I th the, the interventions, the, the technical parts of the interventions are scalable, but the community approach has to be bespoke and it's, it's not in your control, mm. right? Like you're, you're you know, mm. and I know this about me from the way you guys work in communities, unlike organizations that think of themselves in terms of the efficiency of a fast food company that say like teaches everybody how to flip burgers and and it's a you know that most in health interventions that try to scale are using a franchise model and you are using the exact opposite you're saying we go into every community knowing nothing about what's important to them about who their leaders are about how social contagion works Right. Like, yeah. can we can we talk about like you go into yeah. a community like anyway, what what the, the, what does it look like? That was the weakest pushback. I could I, I would only expect <laughs> that from a vegan. Uh, that was a very soy soy push, very soy push. I, I, I'm not intimidated by that at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but um, I should. Uh, can you not control your man? What's what's no, going on? <laughs> I've tried 20 years. I failed. Yeah. <laughs> I myself, I'm a soy soy push. Yeah, I said, don't worry about that. But don't worry, uh, we can uh, we can fix the eye rolls in post. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, all, all 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 things being equal, uh, I, it does take a little bit of mechanism. It's mechanism, right? It's mechanism. It's mm. it's. Uh, um, scale is even understanding of communities and level of interjection is uh, it's it's a matter of just understanding those and creating mechanisms around that. Uh, and and I'm not, and I hate my my word you know uh, I hate when people say common sense. It's a silencer. Like don't talk to me. That's just common sense. Like no, I'm going to talk everything. I'm going to ask everything. I'm going to push back on everything. Or define the elements. Or of define common the sense. elements of common sense in this context. So I love that push. Uh, but but I think either we believe that things are system driven, or we throw our hands up and say, oh, let's wait for the faith for our faith. You know. So if it is systems driven, and and we can figure out those systems, then these are not. Um, uh, undefinable systems. And we've done these systems in other places, whether it was cessation of smoking or whether it was driving, where you've reduced mortality profoundly at the national level. Whether it's, we, we, when we have the impetus, we do it. We do it. But we're, in other places, I mean, uh, uh, heart, heart disease. We know the relation between LDL and heart disease. That's, uh, that's only controversial in, on, on social media. It's not controversial in well-diagnosed, well, uh, well done from ward studies all the way to community-based studies that a relation between LDL and heart disease. It's, that can be operationalized. The, the relation between high blood pressure and those diseases, it can be operationalized. It's systems. Um, 
uh, the, uh, the systems within communities can be identified, the triggers can be identified. The, the, the problem is that those that deal with the financial level of things, that's broad enough, yeah, that financial level of things uh, don't have the impetus to, to put the little bit of effort needed to create systems of abatement. And so when they don't do that, why don't they do that? Because the system is set up to create, to, to get financial uh, remuneration, financial gain, uh, and financial gain can be done at, at the point of creating the disease. Sorry, that, sound, that sounded a little uh, hard, but, but yeah, I mean, um, and financial gain is quicker when it comes to those kind of things, which, which run along the line of our survival proclivities. The, the survival proclivity, get me the sugar, give me the fat, uh, because I need survival. That's easier. You can make people addicted to that easier because that's, that's the survival mechanism for millions of years for humanity. You can build quick financial mechanisms around that. And, and the powers to be, and this is not a conspiracy theory, I'm not, uh, um, but it's, we all know this, the financials of building financial gain around your evolutionary proclivities of survival is a lot easier than the other way around. Uh, and, and, and so how do you change that is, co is complex conversations where you make it known that yes, it is complex, but the outcome is this and the methods is systems and systems that can be scalable have been, have been done multiple times, but we, it's our choice to create those systems. So. Um, uh, it requires this kind of complex conversations. Yeah. C can we talk about what's been going on at CCC since um, we last talked in June? Yeah. Yes. Um, so since we last talked in June, we have um, <clears throat> significantly refined the entire uh, protocol and the process. And earlier, in the month of October, we introduced the concept to the community. We had an event where we shared the launch of the Inspire project, uh, which looks at um, specific factors that are associated with cognitive health um, and introdu introducing that in a, in a beautiful way with the community and involving community members, specifically nurses, social um, workers, uh, you know, other healthcare providers and members of the community to be brain health ambassadors. So what we're trying to do is to give resources and train specific trainers within the community so that they can talk to the members mm -hmm. and share information about brain health, making them aware about the risk factors and um, ultimately be in an environment where we can um, share information and see how the specific factors impact their brain health. And the specific mm. outcome that we're looking for is preventing cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Okay, can we look specifically at like how you go about doing that so you don't come in as the external saviors? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, that, that was a, huge, I think that's central to the and project, is. Um, is to uh, make sure that whatever resources are dispersed within the community stay with the coaches, they stay with the trainers. Um, and training the trainers was at the core of this particular goal. Um, so, you know, we've created online resources, uh, conversations with them, and giving them all the information that they need to know and specifically um, adding on models of coaching so that they know how to communicate that with individuals. Yeah, and, and focus groups, mm -hmm. meeting with the nurses. We actually had uh, at least four meetings with the nurses and, and the community coaches that they self-volunteered. And many of them already had experience working in the, in the churches and in the communities with the health side of things. So there's some awareness of how to connect to the community. There is some intrinsic knowledge of uh, what the community uh, impediments are, what the community proclivities are, what the community opportunities are, <clears throat> and having those conversations with them and, and making sure that we are as open as possible so that we don't bias, you know, two experts coming in, three experts coming in. It's intimidating. So people actually might hold back being completely open. Some of the conversations were had by some of our friends online 
who are not from the community, they're not healthcare workers, but just had, you know, um, uh, asked the right questions. A good friend of ours, uh, Caroline, um, has had many conversations with the leadership of CCC mm -hmm. as well as the nurses, many conversations. And then we ourselves have had uh, conversations uh, with the nurses. In fact, from here on, we'll be going there once every two weeks, having conversations with the nurses, getting them ready for, for starting January, February, where the study or the project will start. We don't call it a study, we're the project. Because even in the study, it's a, the, the, uh, there's an idea that this will be sustainable long term. So all the elements are from the community, including the testers, including the uh, life coaches, including the... Um, uh, the people that are going to be leading the project going forward all are from the community. And where we come in is making the environment conducive for, for the right conversation to bring out the right information. And, and as much as possible, and that's a, that's, we have to be aware of that, as much as possible, we try to make sure that we don't inject our own supposed expertise and our own pre-knowledge into those conversations. Um, and, and we've learned a lot from those. Yeah, we really have. The focus groups have been immensely helpful. Yeah. So what's the next? I know you guys have to go in a few minutes to, to a more important podcast than this. Yeah, I mean, of course. Uh, so. nah, not more important than this. You are, you're our brother. Yeah, no. Familiarity, right? Um, yeah. what, can you give me quickly an example of a, of a community impediment that you not, wouldn't necessarily have thought of that came up through these focus groups and through this community involvement, empowerment, and how the community is addressing it? Hmm. Well, one of the ones that I have seen is, um, uh, so I, I kind of knew about this, but, but it, uh, it's a powerful thing, incredulity, um, um, uh, disbelief, suspiciousness, and they deserve those, those, those uh, emotional triggers that have been placed over time. Mm -hmm. Scientists come, collect data, and then they disappear. Uh, people come, talk to them, all kinds of hugs and high fives and this and that, and they even throw some money and then they disappear. Or worse than that, and historically from Tuskegee and, and others, where people have been abused in the guise of research. And so uh, that's much deeper than you would think everywhere and, and, and appropriately so. And, and, um, and no matter how much trust you create, and we've created immense trust, that's always in the back of the mind, of their mind, and, and also a, a silent um, um, force in the ether, which means that, that it's not it's not just a matter of building trust, it's sustaining trust. So you always, every conversation, you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of it, you have to make sure that you don't uh, overextend yourself. Somebody like me who's very proactive and, and kind of wants to push to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, oh, that's not gonna work. You, uh, you, uh, it, it, it comes across as, 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 as somebody just too eager, too pushy. And we, you can't do that, you have to, and that comes to understanding the community, right? And to me, that psychological impediment, which is not going to go away in the next few years, and it shouldn't, mm -hmm. is is something that's not so much an impediment. It is an it's an awareness that must must functionally slow down the process, so that um, you address their fears. Yeah, mm. <clears throat> it's, there's probably you know a, 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 like with any bad habit or any. You know, negative, you know, negative force that's preventing progress. It has a protective uh, purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and protection is our best friend. <clears throat> but in a in a world where survival is not the only element, it can be our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. The communities that have been most devastated are the ones that have also opened themselves up least to opportunities. True. People that have been most damaged. I'm talking about individually, myself and others uh, that have gone through childhood uh, traumas um, are the ones, ironically and sadly, are the ones that are making themselves least open to opportunities that require a little bit of fearlessness, a little bit of openness. Um, this is a tangential talk, not just about this community we're in, but all humanity. Um, <clears throat> the the universe is not not only not fair, the universe has a... Uh, negative bias uh, for those who've had a ne negative experience. Uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, sadly, and, and we have to be aware of that. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's where it comes when people, not to make this more controversial than, than it is, but, um, when we're talking about giving certain resources more for some communities than others, it is so, so important for people to understand the complexity of that because the backgrounds of, of individuals do matter because they, they slow down the growth exponentially. And you have to, as a society, that's just accommodate for that or otherwise you're just going to accommodate to the most uh, powerful, to the most uh, lucky and to the most uh, resourced people over and over and over again. And you're going to create an imbalance which ultimately will collapse. That was a little bit of a tangential political statement, but so be it. Well, I'd you, love we, to I'd love to follow that up. And, you know, I mean, talking about like I'd love to talk about the the cognitive implications of our current political situation. As we're recording this, we're less than a week away from the 2024 president media. <laughs> you you just have a death wish. You just want to be banned from everything, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Where I, yeah, they can't cancel me. <laughs> They can't. No, not at all. When I'm sitting in my room with my guitar there, they can't cancel my music. <laughs> no. So um, I would love to schedule another one to talk all, all about that. Um, but in the meantime, I know you guys got to go. I want to thank you for for hanging in, for jumping back in to, to complete this episode. And how can people find you, stay in touch with you, learn from you? It's always a uh, pleasure oh. speaking with you, Howie. We love you. Isn't it, though? It, it, is. <laughs> it is. It, it is. is. It definitely is. is. No. <laughs> Believe it. Um, people can find us on uh, our website. We're thebraindocs.com. Um, and we're the brain docs on social media as well. Happy to answer anyone has. And uh, yeah. And our podcast great. is Your Brain On. Yes. We have a nice podcast. It's called Your Brain On. And we talk about the neuroscience of everything. By the way, Howie, is that a, a, just a show guitar or do you play the guitar as well? No, he does. I play the guitar. Can you play some for us now? Because I'm going to bring my guitar out and we're going to duel. We're going to do a go, go out and a deal duel. Okay, well. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that the, uh, the tuner for the G string has stripped. So I have to, <laughs> I have to tune it. I have to do it. I have to tune it like you this. You already have an excuse. Alright. That's not terrible. Alright, what's our song? Okay, I you're gonna sing with us. Uh Hey Jude. Okay, hey Jude. What did Hey Jude in, in what, D or G? Uh whatever's easy for you, yeah? G's fine. There you go. There you go. You got it. Hey Jude, don't be afraid. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart, then you can love and make it better. Better, better, better. That's it. Okay. That's a good way to end. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just, I just rewatched the movie yesterday. Yes. Um, oh, not, I, I, I didn't watch it yesterday, but I watched yesterday last week. Yes, oh, yeah, and yeah, which yeah. of course is all about memory and memory yes. loss. And Ed Sheeran is convincing him to that it might be much better if the song was "Hey Dude." <laughs> <laughs> and of okay. course, the the scat in the middle is "Hey Doody 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 Doody." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh, that was terrific! Thank you so much I for suggesting that. that. Thank you, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much, Howie. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye. And that's a wrap. Hey, if any of my vegan friends know Paul McCartney personally, please ask him. Uh... And that's a wrap. Hey, any of you know uh, Paul McCartney personally, please ask him to go easy on us with uh, copyright infringement, singing, singing his song there without getting permission from Apple Publishing. Uh, yeah, that, that was uh, unexpected and a hoot. So let's see what else is going on in the world. Got a paddle tournament coming up uh, next weekend. First time I have played competitively, which is to say somebody else is keeping score and presumably I'm going to get some kind of a rating. 
So uh, looking forward to that and ultimate season, the, the tournament season here in, uh, in Spain is really ramping up. There's beach tournaments pretty much every weekend. So uh, getting back in shape for that as well. That's about all that's going on here. Oh, I hear there was an election in the U.S. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, not to get too down um, for a second. Um, I spent a couple of days uh, after the election results came out being pretty uh, apathetic, kind of withdrawn, low, like, what's the point? Um, and I'm coming back, coming out of it and really thinking about, like, what's the gift that I have for the world at this point? What matters? What makes a difference? And been doing a lot of thinking and journaling and talking to people who know me. And I think the thing that's getting me out of it is the thing that I can help other people with, which is to remember what we're up to, to really focus on the person that we want to be in the world, in challenging moments, in, in times when it's unclear which team is going to win. Um, and to recognize one thing that, 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 that really helped me was, was realizing like the sadness and the fear and the loss is all the inverse of what I love, what I care about, what I cherish. Um, and so that's the work I'm starting to offer to individuals, to executives, to teams, to leaders, to activists, is a space where we can feel that grief and then rediscover and recommit to what it is we're, we're here to do. So if you're interested in that, you can hit me up, um, hj at plantyourself.com, and we can have a conversation. So wishing everybody a, uh, a week of, of uplift, of coming together, of collective support, of remembering to smile and laugh and feel joy, right? In times like this, joy is a revolutionary act. And uh, be well, my friends.